1937, architect Frank Lloyd Wright built a house for an industrialist uh, by the name of Hibbert Johnson. One rainy evening, Johnson was entertaining distinguished guests for dinner when the roof began to leak. The water seeped directly above where Johnson himself was sitting. Jumped steadily, right on his bald head, drip, drip. <coughs> so, pretty upset. He calls up uh, Mr. Wright in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Frank, he said, you built this beautiful house for me and we enjoy it very much, but the roof leaks. And right now I'm with some friends and distinguished guests and it is leaking right on top of my head. So there was a pause on the line and Frank Lloyd Wright reported the reply, well, Hib, why don't you move your chair? So tonight we're going to be talking about the fruit of the spirit, joy. Galatians 5 says that one of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. And I really hadn't realized until I started doing some research for this um, tonight about how central joy and rejoicing were and are to the people of God. What I discovered is that the word in the Word of God seems to focus very heavily on joy. In the uh, Jewish Encyclopedia, uh, it stated that no language has as many words for joy and rejoicing as does the Hebrew language. In the Old Testament, there are 27 different words that were used primarily for some aspect of joy or joyful participation in religious worship. Hebrew, Hebrew religious rituals demonstrate that God is the source of joy. In contrast to the rituals of other faiths, other faiths, especially of the uh, East Israelite worship. I'm sorry. In contrast to the rituals of other faiths, of the East Israelite worship was essentially a joyous proclamation and celebration. The good Israelite regarded the act of thanking God as the supreme joy of his life. Pure joy is joy in God as both its source and its object. The psalmist wrote, You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The New Testament stresses very heavily, just as much as the Old did, about joy. Be joyful always, 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Romans 12.12 12 says we should be joyful in hope. And Philippians 4 states, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. I've always kind of been intrigued by that last quote from Philipp Philippians. Um, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Uh, growing up, there were some hymns in the hymnal of the church I went to that had that line <coughs> in it. Um, but what intrigues me is that Paul felt compelled to say it again. Why would, why would he need to repeat himself? Then I realized as a parent, I have to repeat myself quite often to my children. And I repeat myself. And I repeat myself. <laughs> and I repeat myself. Why do I have to do that? Well, because the kids just don't play and listen. So, and they're just not paying attention. And there are many Christians who struggle with this idea of joy, of having joy in their lives. The problem is that they just don't have any joy. The evangelist Billy Sunday noticed the absence of joy in the lives of many people he reached to, and he observed, if there is no joy in your religion, you've got a leak in your faith. In other words, if there's no joy in your life, you've got a problem. You've got a leak someplace, and you need to find a way to deal with it. You know, some will point out that the reason they have no joy in their life is because they don't have a reason to be joyful. My life's falling apart. I hate my job. I've got problems at home. I don't have good health. The car's been in the shop for repairs for the 10th time in the last six months. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just don't seem to have a reason for any joy. And I can't blame them. I can't blame them for feeling that way. It's hard to be joyful when life has just seemed to be going down the drain. 
you know, when you're struggling with troubles, when you're overwhelmed with pain, or you're just playing unsure of the future, it's hard to be joyful. But there's a problem with that approach to life. If we wait till everything turns out to be hunky-dory and just the way we want it, if we're not going to be joyful until all the leaks are plugged, then we're never going to experience true joy. <laughs> or if we do have joy, it'll be a pretty rare occurrence. Jesus himself warned us, in this world you will have trouble. Now, the good news is, though, you don't have to wait until you're happy with your life to have joy in your life. The kind of joy that God wants you to have in your life will bring happiness. But the pursuit of happiness will not always bring joy. That realization kind of caused me to remember a little phrase that I learned in math class years ago. All squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. I believe that the same concept exists in Scripture. God's joy will always bring happiness, but the pursuit of happiness will not always bring you joy. Why? Well, the word happiness actually derives from the English word happenstance, which means something that happens because of a circumstance. Thus, what we think of as happiness is an emotion that's caused by our current circumstance. Worldly happiness is almost always reliant on some situation or event to make us feel good. If something good happens, we'll feel good. If something bad happens, we won't feel good. But by contrast, contrast, God's kind of joy does not depend on a present situation. In fact, God's joy can often exist despite our circumstances. A person once asked a friend, how you doing? His friend was upset with something, about something that had happened in his life, and replied, oh, all right under the circumstances. To which the first man replied, well, what are you doing there? What are you doing under your circumstance? God doesn't want us to be under our circumstance. He wants us to be overcomers. He wants us, he wants to give us the ability to have that control of our lives. He wants to set us free from the chains, set us free from the shackles that life can impose on us. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That's why Scripture so often tells us to rejoice, even when it doesn't make any sense. I know that's not easy to do, but he's telling us to do it. In James chapter 1 it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. And Peter told the Christians of the day, Dear friends, do not be surprised by the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you are participating in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So what do these scriptures say? What are they really saying? They're saying if the roof is leaking and you can't get somebody there to fix it right now, move your chair. Change your perspective. Take a little bit of control, a little bit of control. How? By rejoicing. Just take a couple of those signs and just sing them at the top of your lungs. Any song, any worship song. At the first church that one pastor served in, the pastor was visiting uh, one of the ladies in a nursing home. She had recently had a stroke, um, and the entire left side of her body and face were completely immobile. She was pretty difficult to visit with because when, whenever he would try to share some news um, from the congregation, she would cry. If he shared sad news, she cried. If he shared happy news, good news, exciting news, she cried. Everything the pastor shared with her brought about the same feeling, the same heart rending response. And she just couldn't help it. But one day when he stepped into her room, he found her writing letters with her good hand. She was writing letters of encouragement to the people back at the home congregation. Here was a woman who was in a nursing home, crippled by a stroke, whose only formal form of verbal communication was by crying. 
And she refused to let that destroy the joy of Christ that was with her. She took control of her situation by doing the only thing her body would allow her to do for God, and that was to write words of encouragement back to her friends in the church. In the Bible, there's also the story of Paul and Silas. They were ministering, ministering in the city of Philippi, and uh, they were arrested. And in Acts 16, it tells us that the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them very carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. They really hadn't been doing anything wrong. All they had done is preach the love of Christ, healed a demon-possessed girl. But now, they were mistreated, they were abused, they were beaten, they were imprisoned. How would you have responded to that? You didn't do anything wrong. How would you have responded to that? It's not right. It's not fair. They have no right to treat me like this. You could almost hear them as they were shouting threats and curses from the inner cell. Wait a minute. That's not what happened. It tells us, go on in Acts 16, it tells us, at about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Paul and Silas had been stripped, beaten, thrown into the very darkest cell of the prison, chained up. And what do they do? They pray and they sing. They hold a mini revival right there in their cell. They could have allowed their situation to have control of them. But instead, they took control of their situation by rejoicing to God, praying and singing. And the end result, Paul and Silas witnessed to a literal captive audience. And they ended up baptizing the jailer and his family into Christ. God's kind of joy is not an emotion that happens to you. God's joy is his tool. It's a tool for you to use to take control of your life. As Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Well, how can I do that? How can I lay hold of the true joy of the Lord? Well, we need to lay hold of the true source of God's joy. Galatians 5.22, the fruits of the Spirit is joy. In other words, God's Spirit is the source of God's joy. So the more I'm filled with the Spirit of God, the more I'm filled with the Spirit of God, the more of God's joy I'll have in my life. Ephesians says, be filled with the Spirit. Well, how do I do that? First, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in the heart of the Lord. Surround yourself with music that glorifies God. And God will give you his joy. That's what Paul and Silas have done from their cell. Second, always give thanks to God for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You need to spend a great deal of amount of your time in prayer thanking God for all that he's done for you. And God will give you his joy. I suspect that when that what Paul and Silas were praying about while they were I suspect that's what Paul and Silas were praying about when they were in jail. They were reminding themselves of all the good things that God has done for them. The miracles they'd seen, the lives that they'd seen changed. Third, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Find a way to serve others, and God will give you his joy. When the prison doors flew open and the chains fell off, Paul and Silas could have run away and just saved themselves. Instead, they saved, they stayed, and preached to their jailer, the very one who was guarding them, and ultimately baptized that man and his entire family into Christ. They served the needs of this man, and they ended up bringing both he and his family to Christ. I was actually called earlier today back into work on Saturday, kind of things, but it happens. Um, a guy had gone down in his basement and seen that his water meter was just psh, spraying. Just spraying. So he calls the department, the department calls me and says, hey, come on in. So I head over there and you know, and I grab my bucket of tools out of the truck, go down to that basement, tighten her up. It was just fine. 
Galatians 5, like I told you last week. These are tools. These are the tools we need to have in our toolbox. Kindness. Joy. When you use those tools, when you have those tools in your heart from the Holy Spirit, you will find joy, you will find peace. It'll be natural to be kind. But patience, I'm going to talk about in two weeks. For the Christians, joy is more than just an emotion. Joy is a tool to overcome any circumstance that empowers us to rise above the pain and the sorrows of life. Hebrews 12 says, let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. He did not give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him, he thought of nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross. And he's now seated at the right hand of God's throne. Jesus overcame the pain and the disgrace of the cross. He rose above the horror of his crucifixion because he didn't focus on his present situation. Instead, he focused on the joy that was waiting for him. Fanny Crosby wrote over 8,000 hymns. Songs like, Tell Me the Story of Jesus, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, and To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Has Done. But Fanny Crosby had been blind since she was baby. When she was eight years old, she wrote the following poem. Oh, what a happy soul I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. You know, salvation can be a little bit difficult sometimes to understand. Hard for our minds to grasp. Good thing you don't just be my our, our minds. But it's hard to understand, especially when it's not clearly explained. And during the Middle Ages, the most educated people in European villages were the priests, usually. It was a source of information and help, as well as the one holding the keys to heaven. The people coming to the Mass could not have spoken Latin, much less read it. But they knew the priest taught them something magical would happen to the bread and the cup when he prayed the words, um, focus corpus mu, which means this is my body. The people couldn't explain it, but they knew that when the priest prayed, he said that the bread and the cup changed into the body and the blood of Christ himself. They still tasted like bread and wine. They couldn't tell the difference. Since they really couldn't understand the words the priest said, when he said the magical change take place, the words became corrupted when he spoke of it. Today we too speak of something that's hocus pocus, if it's supposed to be magical, and we're kind of suspicious about what really happens. But what we remember at communion is not hocus pocus. It represents his body and his blood, his sacrifice. His suffering. And he took on himself for us. It also represents the joy that awaits us, just as the joy that awaited him. We pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we again thank you for this time. We thank you for the, the praise music. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word. Lord, we ask you to give us your spirit so that we can have the true joy of heaven in our lives, the true joy of Christ in our lives. Lord, we, uh, we wait for that joy of heaven. Lord, we ask that, that you help us realize that, that the true joy that you want in our lives <coughs> is, re, is regard, that, just, that it's there regardless of what is happening in our lives right now. Lord, we ask you to give
give us the strength and the reminders that when something's just not going right, that we just are supposed to just praise and pray. Just praise and rejoice and pray. Lord, most of all, we are here tonight to thank you for the sacrifice that we don't deserve. The death, the suffering, the feeding of your son. Lord, we thank you for, for raising him from the dead. That he conquered death for us. That we could live forever in you. We praise you for that. All glory to you, Lord. All glory to you. It's in your son's name.